So we have a very international uh, crowd with us. Uh, hello from Nepal as well. So let's start. It's two o'clock. Uh, I would like to say welcome to everybody. And I'm very happy that you're joining us on the St. Petersburg Tourism Forum uh, for this conference, Traveling and Working in 2021, which is, of course, a big question mark. And we want to talk about options in the new season. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, myself. I'm Shani Holzman from East Guides West. We focus on guides and they are the frontline workers. And we really think that guides have a uh, paramount position in the travel uh, industry. They control the product. They are making or breaking the tours. And we got yesterday here in Belgium, where I'm based, we got a letter from Bruges from the city of Bruges that is normally suffering from over tourism is now for the, and it's a little trend, very small still, but it's now telling us, and it, this is the letter we got, that you can only guide now in Bruges if you are a certified tour guide. And this is a kind of a applause to the tour guides so that they are getting not only a wild job but a true job the only disadvantage is for guides who don't have the certification it takes three and a half years to be ready and i don't think they want to wait for everybody to be certified so quickly anyway we are going to have a agenda and it's um uh, angelica muller who will start talking about staying safe she's from studiosus reisen and before we start with the agenda, we will have everybody will have about 10 minutes to speak. And like last time, we will have poll questions. Each speaker gets a poll question after the talk it takes about more or less one minute. And the more people answer the poll, the better information we get and we can help you. And we will start off with one little question, just yes or no. And you will see automatically whether it's single or multiple choice because you can click and try how to answer. Then after the conference, we will uh, make the polls again, give you explanation on what we found and share it with you ASAP. So the guide is uh, really important and that's why we have uh, international tour guide recruiting training on our agenda. We also want to know how it is to travel next year uh, so that uh, working in tourism and traveling is going to be as clear as we can make it because it's a lot of experimenting next year as far as we are seeing. So first I'm going to ask you one poll question. The number one, which is launched. Do you feel well prepared? Can you see the uh, poll question? Yes, good. So uh, number one is, do you feel well prepared for tour guidings in times of COVID-19 pandemic. You can answer it now. And in the meantime, I will introduce Angelica. Angelica Müller is the head of international training and uh, recruiting in Studiosus Reisen, which is a study. Uh, they do a lot of uh, study trips. Angelica is an accredited trained trainer. And since the beginning of 1990 active in a museum, pedagogic, and adult training. She studied art, history, cultural anthropology, and Portuguese language and linguistics. And uh, she has been tour guiding for a very long time in um, Portugal and in Portuguese speaking areas, Madagascar, and more countries like also <laughs> India, Rajasthan. Then she became a lecturer for Studios of Surprise and, and from now, from 2011 onwards until now, she is the head of International Tour Guide and Tour Director Training and Development. So I will end the poll and give the floor to Angelica. Welcome, Angelica. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me as a panelist. And um, let's just see if we can do this. So. Can you see the slides? Yes, okay, wonderful. So yeah, um, hello to everybody joining the conference. Um, Studiosis is a, a tour operator for study and cultural uh, tours. Our clientele is, uh, yes, it's 
educated, very interested in cultures, in history, in art history, but uh, also in uh, daily life. And um, most of the, our customers are between 45 and 75 years old. I'm telling you this because a big part of them is part of risk groups. So they are more afraid to travel now in coronavirus times than they were before. Of course, this is, uh, I think this is, it is normal, you can understand this. So from uh, this perspective, I'd like to share some impressions and some experiences uh, with you. On the other hand, as Shani also already mentioned, um, we do have the second wave of coronavirus in Europe, and it's very, very sad. And uh, to see this, and uh, it's in our business, it's in our company as well, we do have to cancel a lot of uh, trips right now. So this is a pity, and this is not so easy for all the tour guides um, around. I brought you some information at first because um, I think I'm um, <clears throat> I'm sharing some experience sorry <clears throat> some um, some feedback of our customers sorry <laughs> some feedback of our customers from the last uh, three months I won't read it completely but um, we are a customer orientated um, company so customer feedback is most important to us and we learn a lot of it and here are some uh, of the examples and there are i think all in all the feedback was very very positive we had about 18 tours from july till <clears throat> last week um not so much <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> not so many tours as we use as we used to have uh, the last years of course but um, we are very happy that some of our clients some of our guests um, started to travel with us again and there are three main issues three main um, subjects which we read and heard over and over again and uh, you see this it has to do first of all with happiness customers are really happy to travel again finally again they waited a long time and this is something i think this is inside of everyone um second our hygiene concept works well customers feel safe and comfortable which is uh, for our uh, clientele one of the most important things while traveling and on um, third point, and this is a very important point, um, that the tour guides play an even more important role in these times as representatives of studiosos, as representatives of the countries as well. And they help the customers to enjoy their trips even in this situation. So quality and success of our trips, of our groups at the moment um, are not just um, something that we in uh, Munich um, are based, um, that we um, um, build up, but it's uh, something that is some sort of uh, teamwork. And uh, tour guiding in these days is much more than it used to be. This is my opinion, um, as I've worked as a tour guide for about 15 years. Um, today, in these coronavirus times, a tour guide is also part of safety and health management. And this is, I think, much more than it used uh, to be. We try to prepare them as best as we can. We built several work groups in-house to handle the situation, everything in close contact with our agencies, with the bus companies, with hotel management, with the tour guides as well, and other stakeholders, because we all have to work together in this time. It's nothing that we can um, that we can um, bring forward just uh, single-handed. So we need to work all together. Um, one result of these uh, work groups are the guidelines for tour guide in times of coronavirus. You see this on the slide on the left-hand side. Um, this is a living document. We now, <laughs> um, yeah, we're working with, um, with, um, with uh, the tour guides, with the experience, with the expertise. Um, and we try to react on the 
on the changings, on the situations. Um, for us, it is very important that all the tour guides that work with us all over the world um, gets our hygiene measures and standards that they know very well all the steps to take from the time prior uh, to the tour till the end of the tour. So they feel well prepared. And of course, it's important for us that they will follow these uh, rules, but they are seen or need to be seen in addition, of course, to local governmental rules. This is the basis of, of everything. And we try to get and to keep the contact uh, with our tour guides. We know all of them personally all over the world. Uh, we are a lot of people here at the office um, at the headquarter in Munich. So there are lots of people who are in, in already uh, almost in permanent contact uh, with the guides. We start before we send them the guidelines, we uh, call them on the phone, we talk and prepare them and we do have webinars in small groups that we uh, provide so that we can uh, check and double check information itineraries, uh, we can ask quest um, answer questions um, and we can uh, talk about what to do in a situation like this or what could they do what could we do uh, if something happens on tour um, at the moment we have or we have uh, yeah, there have been uh, around about 12 uh, webinars since uh, july and we will continue during uh, winter time even if there won't be many tours to tell the truth yes what do we think what is the or what are the most challenges? What are the expectations of our customers during the tour? Like in any other uh, country, in any other agency as well, it's all about social distancing. But I prefer to say physical distancing because I think we are in social contact, um, the tour guide and the people in his group. So it's more about the physical contact and. Um, this physical contact helps uh, limit the spread of COVID-19. So we think it is important and I'll show you some of the photos that are made, that are taken um, in summer. So these are real authentic uh, groups. This is nothing from marketing. Um, so a normal photo that you, you take and uh, share with your friends, uh, maybe. So this is the most important uh, thing at all. And our groups include different households. So um, the, the guides have to take care and encourage also the clients to adapt the appropriate distancing between each other. Um, this is not always very easy because when people get together and they talk together, they would like to, they like to sit together to get in uh, contact. Um, we do have audio devices as well. Um, this is uh, very important and um, yeah, to support the physical distance. We do have uh, our own audio system since more, since let me say, uh, for about more than 12 or 14 years. Um, and this helps us at the moment, uh, this helps a lot. Um, this is one thing. On the other hand, what we also need to do at the moment is to wear masks. And I show you some photos. This is from uh, Vienna. Um, also the museums in Vienna uh, use the paintings and add masks uh, to them to, yeah, to motivate the visitors uh, to wear them as well. It's not just masks, it's um, mouth, uh, mouth and nose coverings. And this is important because we do know and we see all a lot of people who don't wear the masks in an appropriate way, they, they wear it under the under the chin or wherever under the nose. Um, this is important and this is, as I heard from, from our tour guides, this is uh, not so um, not so easy <laughs> because sometimes you have to you have to remember uh, your guests, your clients that they uh, should wear it. Of course, there is no um, no guarantee of 100% that everybody will stay um, healthy and, and safe, but we need to uh, minimize the situations, the risks of infection um, as much as, as, as possible. And masks are a very important uh, instrument to do though. We also um, provide FFP2 masks to all of our tour guides. They can use them if they'd like to. They can also use their own masks, but um, 
um, face shields, so visas are not allowed in studiosis groups. Also, our clients are informed about this prior in advance, um, so that they know what they have will have to take uh, with them. Um, of course, visitor management is important. Information communication. Um, I can't um, explain, and I, uh, every little step. This is just a. a well, these are just some some issues, but um, let me just add one or two things because it has to do with a coach. Um, we we uh, assure our clients and also our tour guides and the coach drivers that they will um, receive or that they will stay in the most healthiest way uh, possible on the coach. And this means we do have seating plans and uh, seating rules. Um, the tour guides have to sit, have to sit um, above in the first row, as you might uh, see it on the slide, and not on this uh, former tour guide uh, seat in the front. Um, this is not just because of uh, distancing. This has also to do with, um, let's say, a little control, because um, sometimes you need to take a look, to look around and to look uh, to the back, uh, to the rear part of the coach, uh, to make sure that everybody's wearing the mask and everybody is, well, is, um, is in good mood, let's say, like this. Um, these uh, seating plans are uh, are um, are a must do. All the bus companies um, agreed it. The coach drivers help us um, for um, to disinfect the hands before uh, the clients, the customers enter the coach. Um, everybody needs to put on the mask before entering and to put off just. Uh, after leaving uh, the coach and in the restaurants it's it's like this that we um, that we um, make sure that there is uh, enough room and space that there are just little uh, groups on one table around about four to six people and these things must be proved and must be implemented by the tour guide. So this is uh, another type of uh, work as they used to, to do before. So they need new skills. They are part of another, uh, as I already mentioned, as another uh, safety and uh, health management that we all need now. I will or I'd like to show you um, before ending, some photos of my personal uh, holidays. I went to the island of Madeira in last September. Uh, I met our agency there. I met local guides. I talked uh, with them. And they do have a wonderful safety management, all the hotels. Um, they do have a regional government. So it's a little different from the continent. Um, with a non-stop flight, you get there very safe and easily. Um, they provide testing right at the airport. Um, in between 12 hours, you get the result. Most of the times, after about five to, to six or seven hours. And there are two seals, two stamps, safe travels and clean and safe that, um, that are available. If the agency, if a company, if a hotel is um, officially registered in Portugal and the clean and safe uh, seal um, offers um, a lot of uh, trainings, a lot of possibilities to show the quality and to prove uh, quality and the safety management. And this was fantastic. Um, I've never felt so safe in the last month as uh, in Madeira. And by the way, it was also fun. It was also a holiday. So um, it was very comfortable. And sometimes I didn't even think about coronavirus at the end. And I think this is something that we all together, um, yeah, that we all together um, need to, to realize and need to prepare for 2021. Because um, even if in Corona times, tourists 
like to travel and they like to have fun and they like to enjoy it and it's it's holidays it's not just uh, stress so we have to balance it in between these uh, two poles let's stay safe and thank you very much thank you very much angelica that was uh, very helpful um in the meantime we have had a um, a hand raiser so that means that i will have to explain that we do the questions after all the presentations have been done I also would like to introduce Svetlana Ivanova. She is part of the St. Petersburg Tourism uh, Forum and Mikhail Shamshirov from Summer Camp Guide Forum. The three of us, uh, we have set this all up. And so we can ask questions after all this. Again, thank you for your insights, Angelica. We have one poll question, and then I will introduce the next speaker, which is Sergei Osipov from Esperance Travel. So we can go to the first results we have. And then you can see that, uh, did you, do you feel you were well prepared for tour guiding in times of COVID? Uh, there is no answer. So I hope we will have more answers for the um, next question. So here we go. Um, the next question is, which topics are currently the most important to you, and it's a multiple choice. So please, um, your you can start answering your questions now. And then we have Sergey Osipov. Sergey Osipov has been for 27 years in business for a long time. We know each other because I do sometimes uh, river uh, cruises to uh, on the Baltic Sea. And so I've gotten to know Sergey as a very good supplier of tour guides in St. Petersburg. And uh, the first 10 years he used to learn everything from rock bottom to where he is now in the tourism industry. And he has been um, working for 17 years at Esperance Travel, serving the many, many of the ships and the international uh, the international uh, community. I have one, oh, now we are going to see all the people are answering the poll questions. I will close the poll now and Sergei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thanks, <clears throat> thanks Shani. <clears throat> uh, hi all, uh, hi partners, colleagues and friends. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be invited as a speaker to another St. Petersburg Tourism Forum conference. My special thanks go to Shani with his guide Guides West, and we met in St. Petersburg before the pandemic several times, and also to Michael Shamshidov, coach and tourism expert. We talked so many times, but we've never met yet. I'm sure we'll meet sometime in St. Petersburg. Both are adamant supporters of travel as an integral part of modern civilization. At Samarkand Guide forum, uh, forum platform, I met more people true professionals and enthusiasts who bring their expertise and passion to support of travel in the unprecedentedly hard times we are living through. There is no time to lose all of them and I do hope they will uh, be kind uh, to pardon me for that. What I'm going to share with you will most probably or better definitely reflect your thoughts on some points or all points. <clears throat> so it's a far cry from a sort of a revelation but in all appearance, it's an attempt to sum up all that goes into travel functioning. The title of my speech is Past to Future, Values to Strategies. Why Past to Future? Because there is no future we may be active players in where we will be able to exert our abilities, our knowledge and skills to their utmost, unless we are well aware of all the features of the past. Ours are features of our professionalism that made it what it was, that special, that the past we felt comfortable in and about. How we will dispose of the new opportunities in the future, cope with and handle challenges of the future will depend on us. So we should put our past to analysis and get the gist of it, still bearing in mind there's no way to bring it back. As Goethe said, there is no past we can bring back by longing to it. There is only an eternal now that builds and creates out of the past something new and better. So that calls for analysis of the past and patience, patience in the present. 
travel business has been badly affected in many ways. In fact, in ways other than complete stop, which paralyzed all across the globe and industry, accounting for about for about four up to 20% of the gross national product and about that high cumulative percentage of human resources, managers, guides, I will put it guides in capital letters, drivers, souvenir shopkeepers, etc. Uncertainty about time of relaunch and format of services delivery in the future is the curse of the moment, as the aforesaid number of people that used to be involved in the industry and thousand times more of those for whom travel, I dare say not used to be, but still has been much more than a pastime. Virtually a true philosophy. Both are literally dying to see travel revived by may not have any idea, clear idea of when specifically it will happen. That said, a prevailing part of the globe population is looking forward to travel to relaunch and that strengthens our belief uh, in that the relaunch is around the corner, whether it be within hands or eyes reach, but it will happen sooner or later. When? If the premise of Corona staying with us forever, as most of the healthcare experts say, uh, the first condition will be death rate control, a sort of gloom predictability, like with the flu and some other diseases. Then COVID safety protocol protective measures like facial, uh, facial protection, social distancing, disinfection on a regular basis will be found enough to ensure a good balance of risk and safety. That will switch on the first stage of relaunch with business workload still downside, but travel functioning. The second and final stage would be a worldwide agreement on an effective uh, vaccine creation up to about one year from now, but maybe earlier. Worldwide vaccination, and that will, defi will definitely allow to overcome the psychological barrier when all people, all states, across the globe will feel they can control corona spread. So first control death rate and then control spread. Still, despite any scientific and uh, common sense based forecasts, we're facing the factor of uncertainty. The factor of uncertainty is what fears anyone most. Its opposite is predictability. Predictability is founded on correct evaluation of options. Given a large number of variables, most of which are out of our direct control. In my opinion, we need a sort of a tool uh, which will allow to work out ways of better coping with as many factors as possible that will most probably be defining the course of further development. And we at Esperance call it multiple scenario approach. So it's well, uh, it's, uh, it, the term is known to to many, uh, to many experts, but so we use our approach, uh, we call it multiple scenario approach. We aim at defining impacts that will be common for multiple scenarios, those that will occur or impacts that will occur irrespective of the given scenario. A, travel boom on travel relaunch at the click of a finger and mass travel back instantaneously, desirable, but the least probable. It will require from us an ability to provide quality services based on access to all the same privileges we used to pamper our clients with. Uh, <clears throat> full compliance with COVID-19 safety protocol on our part and clear assurance of every client of that they stay in Russia with us and every activity they will be engaged in with us will be safe. Excellence at every step, ultimate empathy, to be felt by every client badly hurt by the pandemic. B, gradual reopening, all the same requirements plus and above all, clear understanding that the first clients through trailblazers will feel wary in a way in the first place and secondly, will expect ultimate impeccability from our staff. In a sense, they will expect us to be grateful for that they will be bringing first relief to the industry and, uh, and all the consequences of the business hold deadlock. 
and they will have every right for that. So C, D, and E scenarios will be sort of variations of B. And uh, here I think that is the point to proceed to values. Whatever new realities, whatever scenario is at play, uh, there will be things that will stay intact. Fundamental values serving the basis for corporate philosophy, which proved right ethically and successful in business way until the setting of the pandemic. We will have no issues implementing what is needed to reinstate or shape a new exciting itineraries, vouchsafe delivery of high quality services if we make sure our strategies in building and maintaining relations with our partners, suppliers, and clients are based on fundamental values, the best understandable values for each and every. The foremost principle is, in our opinion, intellectual integrity, which nowadays will mean not only honesty in dealing with clients at every stage, but proactive mode of action. Its implementation will translate in, into transparency, trust, mutual respect in the first place. We also need to run a, a kind of inventory of what allowed us to be competitive and secure the market niche. Most recent correspondence, uh, I mean, our correspondence with our clients shows the niche clientele is determined to pick up where, they, where things stopped on the pandemic announcement, never changing expectations in terms of content and level of comfort. So we should run a kind of a detailed a retrospective analysis. And uh, our suggestion is we should keep staying in touch with partners and suppliers, consortia, whatever you may happen to be part of, independent agents, hotels, transportation companies, restaurants, and guides, again, in capital letters. At the time, so, and we should do that at the time, no immediate business purpose is in sight. A reciprocal support will be paying back at the time of business standstill and shall ensure mutual understanding and loyalty at the time of reboost. And most probably that will be the time when demand will be high for swift adaptability to new realities, which will be exacting and competition terms, which will be stringent. And again, we will need full awareness of safety protocol requirements on our part and uh, clients belief in that we are able to provide complete and ultimate safety. And finally, what will be needed? Ultimate empathy towards clients. It will be on top of above and beyond experience list. So Shani, that's... <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sergei. That's uh, some insights and it's difficult also for everybody next year will be more or less a experiment for everybody who's traveling, for everybody who is working. In the meantime, I'm going to give you the next poll question and everybody asked me to put the poll up a little bit longer because it's, um, it's a little bit difficult. So you can... Um, Continue answering the questions if you wish. If you can uh, do number one and two, then we can uh, put up all the polls up till question number three. So please vote for the first, second and third again. Otherwise I couldn't relaunch it. But the third question is, what are your thoughts about the relaunch of tourism? And this will be a multiple choice. So please check all three poll questions and uh, give your votes again, uh, just because some people asked me to put them up longer so they have a little bit more time to read through the questions and we get all the polls in. So I'll leave it up while I introduce at this very moment, Peter Simey. He is a very interesting uh, young man, I would say. I would love to walk with him through the Gobi Desert, a 1600 kilometer walk. I think I might meet myself badly in this, uh, period if we would ever do that but that's what he has been doing extreme adventures he is a world wandering nomad and he lived and operated in very very many uh, countries 
He has been in uh, visited over 132 countries. He's based in Scotland, so you have to open up your ears for the accent with all due respect, Peter. But some people think Scottish is a little bit difficult. He is absolutely obsessed with adventure travel and that shows because that's where he comes from and that's what he does to the extreme. And he is uh, passionate about these long expeditions. So please, Peter, I give you the floor and uh, whenever everybody's ready, I will take away the poll. Thank you very much. Floor is yours, Peter. Hello everyone. Uh, and thanks very much for attending this and thanks for the invite to, to speak here. Uh, what I'm going to be speaking about here is what we're experiencing at the moment in, in life, not just in travel, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to cover is about life because travel is only part of life. We've experienced decades and days. We went through 10 years of change in around three months, four months, and that's going to have a fundamental impact in travel going forward. The sort of things I'm talking about here, which are outside the travel industry but will impact on the travel industry, is we've seen three uh, 10 years of growth on e-commerce in three months. Between March and June, we had 10 years of growth in e-commerce in, in, in three months. So what does that mean? That means more and more people globally are used to using the internet to buy things online. And that's just not your young millennials coming through. That's older people, people who were never online before or were never confident enough to purchase online before are now purchasing online in numbers never experienced globally before. And that growth it has slowed slightly since things, things have opened up, but we've had 10 years of growth on online commerce in a few months. That is going to fund the interim. Once people get used to ordering stuff online, that impacts on the travel industry because the way they buy changes and that, that will impact on everybody in the travel industry. The next trend that's been happening at a 10 year growth phase in three months is people working from home. Many of us today are all sitting in our home office rather than in an office in the city. So what's that got to do with travel? That's going to continue because people aren't just going to go back and work in offices. If you look at the USA, and people in the USA earning over $100,000 a year, 60% of them are able to work from home. 60% of the high net worth individuals in the USA are able to work from home. And then when you go into Germany, France, all the European countries, it's very similar. A lot of high earning people are able to work from home. They're going to continue to work from home in a hybrid model. They may go to the office sometimes, but they'll be working from home a lot of the time. What does that mean? That means cities are going to change because the demand in the rush hour in cities is going to depreciate. The office price of property in cities is going to change. The ability to manage cities is going to have to change. People working from home will have more time on their hands because they've just saved a two hour commute and a two hour commute in the morning, a two hour commute in the afternoon. They may actually be earning more money in some cases because they're not actually going to work when you measure it, it costs people a lot of money. But when they're not spending it, they can be saving it. And we have seen a massive increase in savings since COVID. They on, again, using US data, they've had an 18% increase in savings across the US uh, since COVID. So that means a lot of people have got wealth now to spend when they feel confident enough to spend it. Again, what is one of the most sought after uh, things for people to spend money on? Travel. We now have people with more wealth going in, coming out of COVID than they went in. Not everybody, because obviously people have lost, lost their jobs and we have a global recession coming, but many people do have an increased wealth because of the changes in society that are happening. Another global change is localization. Localization is accelerating, like COVID is basically an accelerator. It has speeded everything up. So the interest in local activity, local products, local experiences has all gone off the charts. And this is not my opinion, by the way, this is all Google data. This is not Pete's opinion. Pete's got his own opinions, but Google's data tends to be much better than mine. So all you need to do is track the Google data, localization, huge interest in it, whether it's product, whether it's people, or whether it's experiencing. So what does that mean for tour operators and for travel companies? You need to make more authentic product that reflects the areas you are in because that is what the, tr the people are interested in. It's truly authentic product localized. Now that can be for other locals and it can also be for international travels when we eventually get international travel returning back. Another growing trend is an increase in wild space in nature. It's pretty obvious when you think about it, when we've got a pandemic on that thrives in busy cities and thrives where there's lots of people, 
you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that people then start to become interested in nature and wild spaces. But because we have got that trend, and I see that in my own businesses because I'm an adventure tourism operator, uh, the interest in getting out into the wild and into the wild natures has gone off the, has gone off the charts. We've had no issue with demand. We've had an issue with satisfying demand with all the restrictions and all the re regulations, but we have no issue with demand at all. The demand is higher than we have ever seen it since when we, when we opened up the business. So interest in nature and wild spaces, operators need to think that through. Even if you're a city centre operator and a busy city operator, how do you bring in these trends that are happening to what you're doing? There's very few cities in the world that don't have big parks within the cities, big open spaces within the cities. Should you be bringing these parks and these open spaces into your other tour, your traditional tour of the museum? Peter, just one question. Uh, sure. Can you speak a little slower for many of the people, just a little bit slower so they can follow you better? Sure, that's my Scottishness coming out. We do everything quick. Thank we're, you. Always in, we're always in a hurry. So the, the increase in open spaces is an opportunity for operators who haven't used open spaces in wild, wild nature before to discover that, but combine it with the museum tours and the culture tours. It may mean partnering with other businesses to create a dual product. Another trend that's accelerated massively in four months is health and fitness. All the Google trends, all the data has shown a huge online interest in health and fitness. People, when they're locked down, got lots of time to be on social media, lots of time to be searching. Health and fitness has gone off the, gone off the charts, and I'm including mental health in that. Searches for everything to do with mental health has gone off the charts. So if you know that, what do you do to your tours and your activities to redress this demand, because all of these things I'm talking about here are increased demand, not less demand, increased demand. What do you do with your tours and activities to address nature, wild spaces, health, fitness, and mindfulness to allow people to have a healthier lifestyle, a healthier, a healthier experience? Because the demand is there for these experiences when travel come back. But we as operators have to adapt to the current situation, have to adapt to the current customers, and we have to adapt to products and our services to suit what the customers are looking for. The last uh, pr uh, trend that I'm just wanting to discover about, uh, discuss about at the moment, which again fits into travel, is there's been an increased interest in brands and companies that do good. Now we can discuss to the cows come home what good is, and everybody will have a different opinion on what doing good is, but COVID has awakened a lot of people's eyes in the world to a lot of the bad stuff in the world, and they're now searching and looking for brands and companies that give back, that do things that help people. They're not just about giving a quick experience, making some money. So doing good resonates with your customers and with the data that the customers are searching for at the moment. And that, to me, that is a huge opportunity for travel companies and travel operators because by many of the products and services we already offer, we are doing good, but often we don't communicate that to the customers very well. And I think travel operators need to emphasize more the benefits that they're bringing to the local, not just the benefits for the customer, but the benefits that customer visiting that destination does for the local people and the local destination. So brands doing good is another trend. So that, that there, I've just went through eight or seven or eight trends that data is telling us what people are interested in. All have speeded up decades and days, 10 years worth of growth in certain things in three months. It's never happened in our lifetime before. Never, ever. So you need to be aware of this and you need to change your travel businesses to suit what's happening. The next little bit I want to speak about is the economy and your customer's journey within the economy. When I say the economy, there's actually five economies. And so you've got the overall economy, that's the whole global economy. Within that economy, there's five distinct sections. You have the commodities, which are products and things that are high, high volume, small price, little value unless you can do massive massive volume in them you have products that are for sale so when i say products i'm talking anything that is built bought as a product a phone a computer a mug a plate a product and you have services and when i'm saying services i'm talking hairdressers shops and nail bars anything that's providing a service for people there's three distinct uh, economies within the economy if you as an operator fit in any of these economies your life's going to be exceedingly difficult going forward because digitalization 
is aggregating these, com these economies. And only one thing happens after digitalization aggregates economies, the price gets pushed down. Again, not my opinion. We have endless data to prove it. If a product or a service is digitalized and it's aggregated at scale, the price will go down. So the more your service or the more your product is on platforms, like we have Amazon entering travel recently, we know what Google does, Google's the biggest travel company in the world, you have OTAs, et cetera, the more you aggregate these products, the more it will become about price and the value of what you do will go down. So that's the bad news of digitalization. The good news about digitalization is there's another two economies yet. So that's three economies, commodities, products, and services. Sitting above them, you've got the experience economy and the transformational economy. Now, this is where you're pushing value up. If you create travel experiences that push value up and they're not competing on price, you create something that is much more difficult for digitalization to erode. That's not saying you cannot sell them in a digital world. Of course you can. But because they're unique products, they're unique service, you increase the value and you push value up and it doesn't become a margin war fighting on a platform. So create when you're creating new experiences and new tours for your customers, always think, where does this sit in the economy? Who is my customer and who does it sit? And I'm not saying these three other sectors are bad because they're not, it's, it's just the economy. Commodities, products and services are a massive part of the economy. But as a tour operator, if you sit in there, you're going to have to scale to be giant because only volume works in these big scaled economies. If you're in the experience economy, you can be small and still thrive. And digital helps you in the experience economy rather than erode your price. Sitting on top of experiences, you have transformational experience. What's transformational experience? These are where you take a travel experience and it's not just a travel experience. It actually does something to change someone's life. So if we go back to some of the points I was talking about for, before that trends were happening, people being paying more attention to their health, their well-being, their mental health, how they live, how they commute, how they work. All of that is lifestyle, society level changes. That is probably the biggest opportunity the travel industry has ever had. And I've been in the travel industry over 30 years. I've never seen the opportunity that we now have coming if we come out of COVID because society is changing and there will be a demand for a new type of travel product in the transformational economy sector that delivers people much more than travel. It's a life-changing experience for them and they will be willing to pay for it. And it isn't easily digitalized and packaged up and sold. Therefore, you don't have margin pressure on it. So that's the five economies. How does your customers fit into the economies? Well, again, this is not my data. This is Google's data. All customers go through a five-stage journey when they're doing any part of travel. It doesn't matter if you're an adventure tourism operator, a city guide, a, a package tour operator. It doesn't matter what you are. Customers go through five stages of their travel. They go through a dreaming stage, and half the world's customers at the moment are dreaming because they can't do anything else. So they go through a dreaming stage. They go through a planning stage. They go through a booking stage. They then experience what you do in destination, and then they go through a sharing stage. So if you understand the customer's journey, again, Google's tracked that data for years, and they can show the data that everyone goes through dreaming, planning, booking, experiencing, and sharing. Once you understand that, and if you understand the five economies of the world, and you understand who your customer is, and critical, you must understand who your customer is, you can then create the content and the distribution for that content for each stage of that journey. Now, this is where I see tour operators and travel companies failing consistently because they create content and distribute content and it's not addressing each stage of the customer's journey because they use the same content for each stage. And content for dreaming is very different from content from sharing, content from experiencing. So you need a strategy of content creation and content distribution for each stage of the customer's journey. Dreaming, planning, booking, experiencing, and sharing. If you create that content and create the digital distribution and get your customer persona correct, you will not go far long as we recover out of this. I just want one more thing before I finish up on customers and the customer journey. And this is not Google Data. This is purely my experience based on the last 118 days. 
we opened on the 4th of July, which is 100 and something days, maybe not 118. So this is purely from my experience uh, operating with customers for the last uh, couple of months. Certainly our customers have changed. We were not able to operate with our previous customers because we were a group driven operator with fairly large groups, anything between 12, 50, some events were 100, 200 people. We were not able to operate with those groups. So we had to change a product, we had to change a price, and we had to change a marketing. We had to change everything to attract the new customer for the last 100 days, which has basically been families. We've been dealing with families for the last uh, 100 days. We've been dealing with families who are local. When I say local, most of them have been coming from a 150 mile radius, some of them slightly long further, but we certainly haven't been dealing with international clients. We've had one international client in the last four months. But we have had four and a half thousand clients in the last four months. None of them were the clients I would have had, or very few of them were the clients I would have had if COVID didn't happen. Because we had to pivot to change to market, change the product, change the price, change the marketing to get the clients that were available. So my point here is you have to revisit who is available every week, not who you want to be available. Because there is still business happening in travel, but it is not who you were doing business with before. It's who is available to do business with. And it may mean as we recover coming out of this, it may be a very long time before you get the customers back who you actually want to have, but there is still customers available. And I've certainly not got my international customers back. I've got none of them back because I can't. They can't fly in and we can't fly out. So my inbound business and my outbound business are not dealing with them customers at the moment. But there is customers available if you can change your product, your marketing, and change your customer persona to get them. And all of these points that I covered before about the customer journey, dreaming, planning, booking, experiences and sharing, and the commodities, uh, the five uh, economies, commodities, products, services, experiences, you have to address each one of them and see where your new customer fits in this. Because your customer will fit in somewhere, and that's the start of the journey of creating the new products to get you out. Hopefully, in a year or two years' time, everyone's back to doing similar business that they were doing before with the same customer groups before but i think you're going to be very optimistic to think you're going to be doing business with the same customer groups in 2021 that you were doing business with in 2019 your customers are going to be different and that's everything from me for this one thanks very much for listening to my ramblings thank you peter that's very very insightful i uh did try to type up with you together so it made it easier for some people to follow your speech and my fingers are now cramping a little bit <laughs> that's fine thank you so much because it's totally different uh, view on uh, tourism and definitely with the digitalization is something there is no way around that one and to capture that that's for sure very very good so i see that there is many people who answered already question number four the polls are still up so i just leave them open because um they should work a little bit different but they don't and that's probably my training in uh, zoom so what's your number one barrier to growing your business excluding COVID, is, uh, as you can see, many of us say that it's the number one using technology to address changing work methods and to stay competitive. And that's a big challenge for all of us. I think we can definitely say that. So in the meantime, thank you very much, Peter. If uh, we were live, we would all applaud to all the speakers that have been speaking already yet. Now we get somebody else also in the adventure travel Sunita Ramanand she is working for the very beautiful company Travel the Unknown based in London and she has been 15 years in the travel industry she is a very very um, versed traveler she knows exactly what she wants in travel and how to proceed in travel and uh, Travel the Unknown actually has won many, many awards. So Sunita, I give you the floor and thanks for being with us. We look forward to hearing you. Thank you so much, Yanni, and thank you for inviting me to join the conference today. I, am, I feel very honored and delighted to be sharing a platform with other industry experts today. So, you know, and while we all come from different fields in the industry, our focus and goal is the same and the dif different perspectives and insights that we gather today will help us to adapt and move forward in the new normal. 
So before I move on to today's topic, I would like to give you a brief introduction, uh, everyone else, a brief introduction of my company, Travel the Unknown, and our ethos, which might just explain better as to you know why we do what we do. And uh, so let me bring up a presentation here. I need to do a screen share. So are you all able to see my screen? Fantastic. Yes. Thank you. We can. So the founders and directors of our of Travel the Unknown, David McGinnis and Rahul Agarwal, they traveled around extensively since their university days and were particularly drawn to places, um, to remote uh, locations where local customs and cultures had not been impacted by tourism. Later, they together set up Travel the Unknown with the aim of helping travelers discover these unspoiled hideaways in some of the most off the beaten track locations. So now going on to the bit about why our tours are off the beaten track or why we chose to work with the, you know, go off the beaten track. And it's all about like, you know, the people who manage them on the ground. We are aware of the environmental and uh, downside of larger tour groups. And for this reason, we consciously operate in smaller groups and keep our ecological and cultural footprints as small as possible. This way we can benefit, uh, deliver the benefits of tourism without the negative impact uh, of mass tourism. From a group size of about 12, we used to keep it small to 12, but going forward in 2021 and 22, we will keep it, we will cap it at a maximum of about eight. We launch a destination only if one or more members of the team have personally traveled to a destination, met up with the local team and the tour guides there. Our experience combined together with the expertise of the local guides has helped us design and put together each and every one of our tours. A very important criteria for all our tours is that they benefit the local communities. In the offbeat and rural locations, Accommodation is normally family-owned guest houses, homestays, or small hotels. Where possible, we also organize small things like uh, cooking demos in local homes, followed by a meal with the family, which further helps give an insight into the local customs and culinary traditions. We also you know, take people to visit uh, local artisans uh, and craftsmen to see them at work and get the clients to try their hands at it. As um, Sergey had mentioned previously before me, um, it is like, you know, the industry impacts not just the main the tour operator, the companies and the suppliers working with it, but it has a wider reach and affects, impacts everybody in the industry, remotely connected to it also. Why local guides? Now, this is a question we often get asked by our clients. Why not the tour manager uh, leading the tour from the UK? So, what is the answer to that? What is the role of the local tour guide? We feel that local tour guides are the true ambassadors of their country. They are passionate about their history, culture, traditions, and people, and they take up guiding with a sense of great pride. By sourcing professional, knowledgeable, and friendly guides, we try to ensure that our clients relish authentic experiences and get to enjoy the trip of a lifetime. Guiding is not just about, sorry, it went too fast. Guiding is not just about showing travelers around the site and the monuments, but also about giving them an insight into the customs and the way of life in the country. Most clients enjoy chatting with their guides on just about every topic, politics, movies, religion, or just general stuff, which allows them to learn so much more beyond the touristic site. Clients even plan repeat visits and recommend travel to their friends to countries because of their positive and memorable experiences with their tour guides. They plan their trips around the recommendations offered by the tour guides and the availability, their availability to be able to accompany their clients on the future trip. So now this means adapting to the new normal. And how do we do that? There will have to be additional measures in place now for the foreseeable future. It is travel is going to change, and like you know, even even though. A lot of things may happen and travel may open, but it will be done differently. Our local partners 
are working on enhancing health and safety measures and putting new protocols in place. Not just this is not just for the clients traveling, but also the staff on ground, like the drivers and the tour guides. So that that is where the additional responsibilities for tour guides would come in, wherein they will have to ensure that all these procedures are carried out diligently on every tour on a daily basis for the clients as well as for themselves, like conducting daily temperature checks, carrying safety kits for clients containing masks, gloves, and sanitizers ensuring that local distancing is followed in the vehicles, restaurants, the sites and the monuments they visit, especially if there are other tourists around you. They must have the contact information of the closest medical centers at hand when they are traveling, just in case of any client or the guide or driver uh, starting to show any symptoms. They must also ensure that backup guides and drivers are in place should the need arise and in switching they are affected. And while we are in this transition stage, we are also kind of mentally preparing our clients and local guides for the new normal. So right now, in keeping with the current times and the Zoom culture that has caught on, we have come up with a virtual tour concept. As people are missing travel, we offer them the opportunity to do so um, via Zoom and utilize this time to build their bucket list and narrow down on the destinations they would like to visit once travel resumes. So we have been conducting online events since the last few months, wherein we get our tour guides, our local partners to present their destinations and take the clients on a virtual tour of the country and also then answer questions that the clients would have. So just like the normal circumstances, have a question answer session with them, talk to them about the destination and just keep it going, keep everybody's interest alive and going. So how is traveling and working going to be in 2021? What can we expect going forward? As we all know, travel will happen. And, but for now, the big question is when? The tourism industry is very resilient. It has suffered the impact of political factors, war, natural disasters, and recovered from all. So while this situation is unprecedented, we will come out of this too, stronger than ever before. And we are going to require some help from our respective governments to get the industry back on its feet by easing travel restrictions, maybe introducing testing procedures at airports and making PCR tests easily available at healthcare centers. You know, with advisories in place, travel advisories in place, clients are unable to get a travel insurance cover either. So this must be relaxed too. So we have come across many clients who are wanting to go out to travel because they realize you know, that it is, as long as they are cautious and do the right thing, they can go out. Other than taking a flight, maybe a long or a short haul flight, other things are pretty much similar to what we do here. We are going out to restaurants, we are going out to supermarkets, we do go out to, you know, gardens, parks and other places and trying to live as normal a life as possible. So the same has to be applied wherever they do travel to. But it's just about sometimes the PCR test which are available here are not as freely available. They are expensive, they are a deterrent because it's just an additional cost on top of, a huge additional cost on top of what they would spend on the holiday. Plus the uh, thing about insurance. So let's hope going forward over the next few months, we do find a relaxation in all these rules, which kind of encourage and give the confidence to clients to uh, travel. Since the lockdown, we have actively encouraged uh, that's another thing, right? You know, we have actually encouraged our clients to postpone rather than cancel and opt for a refund unless circumstances do not allow them to postpone their trip. We are also being very flexible with our clients and allowing them to switch to us should they no longer want to travel to the destination they booked originally. And clients do not have to pay anything additional in order to switch the tour. That is a risk we take to cover their deposit. But that way, so we can get the local partners to keep the refund uh, they receive, uh, to keep the funds they have received for the tour originally booked in credit for to be used against any future clients who travel. And we choose not to push our local offices and tour guides who have been hit hard by this for any refund. It is a tough one with not much new business coming in at present, but every bit helps. So, and why not? Like, you know, after all, we are a team together. We may be here, but our local partners around. We are all a team and we need to support them to get back onto their feet 
we want to take it ahead. And by keeping all our options ready and training our guides to follow strict health and safety protocols, we can get set for travel and start as soon as the border starts to open up. In the meantime, we must all stay inspired and keep everyone inspired. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunita. Thank you very much for your insight. And yes, we all have to stay inspired. Um, as we learn and we stumble forward in the new future, this is uh, something that is really triggering most of us. What can we do and how can we do it? We are running a little bit over time. So I saw that most of the poll questions are already answered. And um, please, oh, my dog is suddenly coming in. I'm sorry about that. And uh, there is definitely a question that we can think like, do you think local guides play a significant role in rural community development? Most of you have answered it already. If not, please do answer uh, this question as well, because that's one of the sustainability goals that we have in the World Tourism and Travel Council as well. And uh, it's, of course, very important that the benefit of tourism goes to the local people and not to the big companies uh, far away from your own country country. So, and I'm very happy that I may introduce Marsha, Marsha Akaya. She has been a tour guide for over 30 years. She's born and raised in St. Petersburg since she really lost St. Petersburg. I think I should take a guiding tour with Marsha to see much more from St. Petersburg. And she is a clever cookie. She has um, three university degrees, two from St. Petersburg State University. One is in English and the other one in international economic relations. And the other one is from Stockholm, an MBA the school of um, economics in Stockholm. Now she started um, tour guiding in her second year of university and never stopped. And when she started, it was also a great opportunity to be able to meet foreigners because prior uh, to the wall coming down, that was not possible. And so she had the opportunity to learn from foreigners to travel without becoming part of the Communist Party. It's a very interesting way of coming in. And she is really focused on groups of all former Eastern Blocs and um, well, neighboring countries, China to Hungary and everything in between. So Masha, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Shani. Yeah, sounds like a great life. <laughs> uh, so hello everybody. And I'm just honored to uh, speak, speak before some lovely people. And I guess I'm clearly at the dreaming stage now. So we as guides are dreaming here that our job will come back. And well, the new normal, we kind of miss the old normal, but I guess we need to get ready. Uh, I'm a board member of St. Petersburg Tour Guides Association. So I'm, I'm actually going to stand by my people. And what I'm going to talk about is actually promote the best guides in the world, Russian guides. Uh, tour leading is my main job. So I guess I will speak from this kind of perspective. And I don't want to look and sound like an idiotic optimist, but I will be speaking about how good uh, Russian guides are because we don't want to lose the best professionals of our trade. And under current circumstances, uh, people are fleeing, they're leaving the trade. And some analysts predict that up to 30% uh, best guides you know, will, will live. Uh, before the pandemic is over. And that's quite tragic because obviously the best people live because they can find other places to work. So what I'm going to say is that Russian guides have definitely a few upsides. Uh, first of all, guides in Russia are extremely well trained, uh, extremely well trained, especially uh, where tourism has developed long ago. And I don't only mean specialized training, but you uh, need to qualify before you're even enrolled in a guiding school. Uh, candidates are required to have a university degree, preferably in humanities, like languages, history, history of arts, and a proficient command of at least one foreign language. So when you decide to be a guide and to guide foreigners, you, you must uh, speak this language already. And there's initial training to become a guide, which takes at least a year, and then there are, and then you get certified, and then there are regular improvement courses and sessions and 
passes from all sorts of museums, so it's an ongoing process. Uh, since our job is extremely seasonal, most guides have to have another job during off season, and then a vast majority of them work as school teachers, university professors, or language instructors. So you can imagine the level of their expertise. And of course, uh, this training, guiding training, is not only about the content itself. Itself. So we're not learning stuff about places. We are taught how to create this content, and. Um, we're trained in methods and techniques of guiding and delivering a whole experience long before the very term storytelling was invented. Guides here have uh, had been taught to turn an excursion or a whole trip, a whole journey into a cohesive story, uh, creating anchors link linking each photo stop or museum or a small town on the way to the next one and weaving it all into the tissue of the overall tour. Uh, and and that's great. So as a result, clients come out with a whole experience with, um, with a complete journey uh, where, where everything is tied together. Uh, second, Russian guides tend to be very committed, more than just helpful. They are motherly at times, if I may say so. Uh, they treat their customers as personal guests very often, and they're willing to accommodate them and this is not only due to our inherent hospitality. Obviously, every nation in the, in the world claims that they are the most hospitable people. But here I will go back on history a little bit. During you know, the Soviet Union time, foreigners were not allowed to uh, mix with locals. That was very hard. And local citizens could be persecuted, even go to prison for just talking to a foreigner in the streets. So the Soviet government uh, well, try to act kind of softly separating foreign tourists from locals. They wanted them to feel comfortably, uh, to feel comfortable and kind of not notice what's going on. And then the guide was the instrument. Guides were supposed to be so comprehensive and so all embracing in their knowledge and service that their customers felt no need to seek anybody else's company advice or help. And this is a major reason for this very tough and good training system and tough requirements the guides have to comply with. So guides were supposed to stay with a group from dawn till dusk, be able to answer any question, the company anywhere, basically kind of cloak their customers from any trouble. So I guess the system of this all round care and service is still there and it's still in their guiding principles. And another important fact is the language. We as guides speaking foreign languages kind of benefit from this weird Russian language and the Cyrillic script, which is challenging to uh, foreigners. And besides uh, the majority of Russian population still has a pretty poor command of foreign languages. So Moscow and St. Petersburg are much better. Um, the situation has improved fantastically and there are English language signs and there are um, menus are in English and so the staff speaks English, but young people in the street react well to English and can speak some, but in other parts of the country, this is still a big problem. So guides need to be around more than in many other places in the world. And you see now why Russian tool leaders do kind of like to take extra care of their customers and they're perfectly okay spending time with them. So when we are on long trips we do that all the time and some best russian guides are not just highly professional you know talking heads they're really committed and even personally involved in every aspect of their journey with the group which makes them excellent tool leaders and often it's a combination of a guide and a study leader you know think of all the degrees that guides have to have so i myself have three as you've heard thank you shani uh, and I can perfectly well kind of softly enlighten my customers on history and culture and politic political developments and places we go to, uh, just kind of in the meantime, just over a dinner, it doesn't have to be a formal lecture, and we love sharing, so that's what we do. My particular favorite experience is working with kind of lifelong learning public, and all this storytelling is right there. Uh, under present circumstances, with COVID-19 related policies, this motherly attitude to groups, I think will work pretty well. And making sure that everybody follows the uh, policies and everybody wears these masks and stuff like that. So I'm sure we can do that. 
besides um, in St. Petersburg, all these um, policies are now well advertised by the government and they're quite harsh re requirements, at least on paper. Working for Russian employees and for international employees is a little different. And I've had experience with both and mostly work with international employers and, um, you know, Russian experience requires some adaptation and two leaders need some instruction concerning how things need to be done in Western, from the Western perspective. There are reporting requirements, how to deal with documentation, medical insurances, and how to encourage feedback and what language to use resolving kind of conflicts and some difficult situations and promoting corporate style and culture and principles. Uh, also linking a particular trip to other products um, of the um, travel operator criteria, good service, that's all uh, can be done, can be achieved via good manual and two or three day corporate training seminar. I love those seminars when uh, I personally think they're very useful. You feel you're like part of a big family, You embrace the values of the, of the company and this is kind of a quiet sense of belonging to a big team so that all can be done and it's important so i think russian guides can find beautiful place among this international team of travel tra traveling experts and i think that this combination of great education expertise practical skills and wonderful command of languages and caring attitudes of russian guides make them very competitive on the global scale. And right now, these people who don't have a job, they are studying more, they're improving themselves even further, they're mastering new themes and languages. And when the time comes, they will be not just ready, they will be even better than they are now, those who will stay. So thank you for your attention. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. It's, uh... Indeed, a very good insight, and I was very triggered by your competitive advantage. I can see now that committedness and a personal touch is really where you are, and uh, definitely also in the regions, because uh, further down the road in Russia, which is a long road where you can go, it's indeed more difficult to find people speaking certain languages, whereas we've seen and experienced uh, by ourselves also that there's many Spanish-speaking Russians, there's many Portuguese, Italian speaking Russians, German. So I think you can really make a good um, to pool with all the languages that we need for Western guests. So okay. the last uh, speaker will be Svetlana Ivanova. I just remember you to the last poll question, but the polls work a little bit different with excuse from my side. I'm not the best technical person yet, but I'm doing my best. And the question that uh, we had for uh, this talk with uh, Masha is the guy's salary should be, and you've already partly answered. If you didn't answer yet, please do so now. And I will introduce Svetlana in the meantime. She's the chairperson of the St. Petersburg Professional Tour Guide Association, born and raised in St. Petersburg, 20 year tour guide herself, mostly working with team groups in Russian and in English. And she works a lot with, um, physically handicapped people as well, which is, of course, a total different way of tour guiding. Svetlana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, dear colleagues. So thank you very much, Shania. Um, as I said, I am the chairperson of St. Petersburg Professional Tour Guides Association, and I will be the last panelist as a host of today's conference. And I'm also a tour guide and the person who really meet our guests and nurse them while they are in St. Petersburg. And that's all my colleagues. I lost my job because of Corona. So I have many hopes and expectations for the next season. But as a person with 20 years of experience, being honest, I'm not very optimistic. Nobody can guess what will happen and I'm not a prophet to predict. So I would like to concentrate on the problems we've already had before. Four. And I think they won't disappear by, by vice versa, they, they become much more vivid. So the problem number one we have in St. Petersburg and I think all over the world is getting into places of interest, museums first of all. I don't know whether our colleagues from outbound to companies realize how difficult it was sometimes to get tickets to the popular museums. Just to believe, it was a trick 
and pretty often there were no tickets to the second day, to the second time. Uh, the reason was over tourism, of course, and now you can say no one expect any in the next few years, but right now we have very strict governmental regulations. For example, in St. Petersburg in Russia, only five persons in a group, not more. This summer, while there were no organized groups, no foreign tourists, no school groups, it was still almost impossible to get tickets to the museums, even for the citizens. Museums were open, but you couldn't get in. And that will be a huge problem in the next year. When you saw the tour and promised your clients this, this, and this at February, for example, and finally at August, you realize you can't do this. That is the first problem. Uh, problem number two is the price. You know, five people in a group, that is actually a private tour, a luxury service. Are you sure people ready to pay for it? I think they don't. And we guides, we don't want our salary to be decreased. We suffered a lot because of pandemic and many of us are in a critical situation. So we want at least the same money as we had before Corona. So what's the solution? It seems that um, we have to change the whole idea of the classic standard tours in St. Petersburg and I think all over the world. We should be more customized. For years, it was like a competition between different tour operators. Who will put more museums and sites in one tour? It sounded very attractive for the clients. Here, they can see more. But in reality, people don't understand, for example, the distances, traffic problems, how big is a museum, how it is crowded, how long is the entrance line. By the way, please, don't promise them entrance without waiting in clients. It never happens. We usually have lines. Use even for pre-arranged groups. That's it, that's reality. And right now it's really the time to skip some of the museums, to make the itinerary more relaxing. You know how tourists call these overwhelmed tours? A, B, C, another bloody church, another bloody castle. And that is true, that's how it was. My colleagues and I, we did our best to make such tours enjoyable and relaxing, but let us face the truth. Those tours, with many places included, were neither relaxing nor enjoyable. Look left, look right, and then run not to be late to the next spot. That is not okay. It was not okay before, but now, when we face the problem of the price and the problem of getting tickets, it is even more actual and important. And, you know, anyway, people now don't want to be inside, to be in a crowd, surrounded by other tourists, probably infected. That is not safe. So let's solve this problem. And the easiest way is to replace museums, not all of them, of course, with the outside tours, walking tours. We have a lot to see in St. Petersburg and parks and gardens. I don't mean Nevsky Prospect. We have plenty of charming and quiet streets where people can enjoy the city itself. We can give our guests a wonderful opportunity to discover the city. What about a real city tour? Not just driving from one place to another by the tour dedicated to the city itself. We have plenty of photo stops for taking pictures with an opportunity to walk, to sit on a bench, to spend time looking and learning, examine the details, listen to the stories. That's what people really want. One castle, one church is more than enough if they have only two days in St. Petersburg. So you have a choice now and your guests have a choice. Speaking about famous and well-known places and museums, we usually have a sort of a cliche. This place, this museum is so famous, we must include it. No, it's a huge mistake. And my experience for 20 years shows that only 20% of tourists really want to go to this or that museum. For them, it is important. Only 20%. For 80%, it doesn't matter at all. Half of them have no idea what is inside. So why don't you show them, for example, Pavlovsk or Gatchina, I don't know, or Anenbaum or Alexandria Palaces. They're gorgeous and beautiful and they're royal residences. They're at the same level as Catherine Palace and Grand Palace in Bidikov, but everybody rushes in those two. I highly recommend to split the flows. By the way, if you promise your clients a suburban royal residence, they will be pretty happy. No one will ask you, which palace exactly do you mean? Those palaces are really cool, but you will be flexible. And don't forget about 
palaces in the city, like Menshikov, Stroganov, Sheremetyev palaces, homes of Russian nobility. They are fantastic, but nobody heard about them. Take them into consideration if you think that St. Petersburg is a city of palaces. But we have a lot to see, not only palaces. Um, if now we are forced to have small groups, you can figure out the personal interests of our clients and customize the tour to make it really private. We have artillery, naval, railroads, museums, museum of water, museum of Russian vodka, of course. Um, don't forget about Russian museum. You know, that is such a shame that being in Russia, our tourists don't have an opportunity to enjoy Russian art. They're interested in, they ask about it, but it's not included by some reasons. They are looking for Russian art in the Hermitage, but we have mostly, you know, European art, and, you know, worldwide. And another important thing I'd like to draw your attention on, let me be honest, our foreign guests are not really interested in history. They don't have a degree in art. They mixed all the arts. They don't care much about the historical past, but they are very interested in our modern life. So it seems right now, it's a perfect time to focus our tools, not only on our historical heritage, but on our local life experience. You can't imagine how happy people from all over the world are when they have an opportunity to do some simple things like, I don't know, like a metro ride, for example, not just up and down, but to see five, four, of six stations and find out how beautiful and elaborate and different they are. You know, we are famous for our suburbs. Then people are happy with the farmer's market, for example, or when they have an opportunity to stop in the middle of nowhere in the countryside to take a picture of whatever, of typical Dutch or summer house, or someone's home they liked. Let's make our tours more alive. You know, I remember one of my guests, she was a medical nurse. And as it was a private tour, I just asked her whether she'd like to visit the hospital. She was amazingly happy. We spent there not so much time. She just walked around a bit, but as she said, it was a cherry on the top. Of course, we can't take 40 people in such a place, I understand. But now there are anyway won't be 40 people in a group. So think about touches of everyday life, about at least driving through a new residential area where people can see how we Russians live, to see, I don't know, the kindergarten or the playground for children. Think about the countryside tours. We have amazing nature. So I can highly recommend something. Bogoslovka village, for example, with wooden churches and houses. Then battle tours are very exciting battlefields, because for many people, the World War II is not the far past, but a part of their life, or at least a part of the life of their family. We can go to medieval city of Freiburg, we can go, we have a very, very good connection with like Novgorod, Pskov, um, Karelia, Ladoga Lake. Uh, nowadays, I'm speaking about the comfortable high-speed trains. And that is, of course, for those who've already been in the city, also called return clients. But in order to have return clients, we have to make their first tour enjoyable and not overwhelmed. When you put everything in two or three days, there is an illusion that I've already seen the best things. So there is nothing to do here. What's the reason to come back? I did the top 10. Think about it. We want our tourists to return back to the city. And I think you want too. So let's think about more relaxing tours. And that is much more important about customized tours. Let's sail not a standard version of the city, but a unique tour with a special a something for different people. And we guides will be happy to advise because we know our city and its diversity, like all local guides all over the world. So thank you very much for your attention. Stay safe and good luck. Thank you very much, Svetlana. This is very much a plea for localization and, and indeed looking at a destination with different eyes from really from the people that live there. So that's indeed very, very important. I think uh, what we see is for the options uh, to work next year, we all realize that it may be maximum of 30% of what has been offered to us in the years previously. Whereas as a cruise director myself in summertime, I also always wondered why when we are in a beautiful city like Antwerp or Amsterdam or wherever, do we rush out of it immediately with a bus and go somewhere else? 
Uh, this is, of course, a product that was, as I would now say, uh, almost old school. Um, because the local experience is what people wanted already prior to COVID. Local experiences are, as Peter also said, and Angelica Müller also said, is now what people are looking forward to. Smaller tours, smaller groups, and I think that's the quality. In this area where I am at, we have a think tank with some very big tour operators in the Netherlands and Belgium, and with small operators, really small ones, initiated by, by East Guides West to think about how we can connect with the travelers again and how we can involve the local guides uh, to a better level. As we saw yesterday, we already got this letter from Bruges that they have to be certified, which most of us are in big towns, but not in remote areas. And remote areas are actually, I think, where the future has a lot in store if we do more. And in the tours, less is more. So let's have a look uh, to the questions. We have a few questions or one. If somebody has a question, please put it in the Q&A session. I had one question of Danelli Romana, Romana Santana. And she said, the positions that were expressed, I believe it was by Peter, are quite right, except for the vaccinations, or maybe it was uh, Sunita. If vaccines will be compulsory for the travelers and guides as well, it will let out a segment of the population that due to health issues cannot risk themselves being vaccinated. Um, so what would be the case for these people? I think the question, who wants to take up this question, just raise your hand if you have an answer to that question, because if we exclude people that cannot or also fiercely do not want to be vaccinated, what happens uh, with this group of travelers? Sunita, you want to answer this one? Okay, I could take this, thank you. So yeah, I mean, we are going to face this. There are going to be a lot of people who might not want to be vaccinated. And um, you know, it, it's not just, I think the whole world is relying on the vaccine today, but let's say it's still a long way off and whether it works or not, you know, is, is a big question. Tests are still on, but there is no conclusive answer we have there. And also medication could be something which hopefully um, provides an answer to that. And uh, like how antibiotics came up and you know things where people could feel confident that if they do get it, they, there is a possibility of them being cured. That is something I think we may have to rely on uh, going forward, but you can't really, it will be hard to stop somebody from traveling just for that reason that they are not vaccinated and they could you know, potentially be dangerous because like I said, these measures that we put into place will have to stay in place for some time because for the whole world to actually get vaccinated and move forward, if we're talking a few years, we could be going into 2022, 2023. So they are still going to be in place. And I think that's, that's the way forward. If they don't have a vaccine, they still go ahead they will have to follow um, whatever guidelines or protocols are in place. And hopefully there's a medication should anything go wrong, which helps them. Thank you very much. Uh, also prior to this conference, I spoke with many other uh, tour operators and some I asked to, to join from the HR divisions. And they, uh, they said, well, we, we would love to talk about what we can offer, but we are not sure what, whether we can offer it anything at all, uh, whether big or small, they all have the same problem. But um, if there's no more questions, I think I can share the polls. And I think we will have to see who is going to travel. We have seen in the think tank with the big uh, tour operators, just in the small area of the Benelux, that people that do travel, they feel like VIPs, very important people, because they are treated like really welcome. Many of them also speak about it's like around of the 90s, beginning of the 90s experience where you could just enjoy a town, see the local people and talk to them. And actually also uh, now with reservations uh, in advance, you can go to a museum and you have two hours, sometimes two and a half to enjoy a museum. From those people, we gather also that they say it's more relaxing but the cities in the, in the centers are still dead for, if you talk about restaurants and bars, they cannot just go for a bar or a restaurant, but they do feel very welcome. And I think that's the trend forward. 
I will share the results of the poll just right now so that you can see, but we will make for you a nice summary as we did in the previous conference, send them over to you to share and to look at them. So if you see there is, do you feel well prepared for tour guiding in times of COVID-19 pandemic? 19 people voted 63 uh, yes and 11 say 37 percent say no so that's still quite a big group of people then which topics are currently the most important to you and 50 percent uh, excuse me 67 percent restore travelers confidence in safe traveling actually this is very important because that's out of our reach as tour guides or tour operators, but we have to make sure that the guests feel safe, that they are willing to make the decision to come back and travel again. So this is uh, from 30 people have uh, answered all the polls. The third one, what are your thoughts about the relaunch of tourism? Biggest group said businesses will need to take steps in, to protect workers who are at the front line in delivering. Frontline workers today are suddenly in the picture. I've always, that's why East Guides West was born. We wanted the frontline workers, the tour guides, also the people in the, in the hotels that are serving directly, that are at the reception desk. They are always more or less a little bit like the low line. But now even Harvard is writing about why it's so important to take care of frontline uh, people, workers, because they say they're in the end with the digitalization, the only people that are going to see the guest or the customer. And that's the highest uh, link in the value chain, the paying customer, the paying guest, standing in front of the operational person. And so these two have to come together. And that's what you also say with this 70%, this was a multiple choice, 70% say businesses will need to take care of that. Very important uh, insight. Next question, what's your number one barrier to growing your business, excluding COVID? This is a difficult question because using technology is being neglected a little bit by the travel industry and the travel industry was leaping behind because everything went well. And the whole industry was a little bit like, oh, well, the trees grow until the sky. But no, using technology to address changing work methods and to stay competitive are to be seen as the biggest barrier. And that means training and getting new skills in your, uh, in your curriculum. Next question, do you think local guides play a significant role in rural community development? Yes, to a large extent has been said by most of the people. So that means they are the ones who make the community benefit. And that means also get an income from the tourism and not all the people being show, shown in town, taken out and dine somewhere else and do some shopping somewhere else. So this is a very hopeful answer, I think. Number six, should we change standard or classic tours? 47% said yes, we should add more everyday experience, everyday live experience. Svetlana, here you go. This is just what you said. It's really true. People are looking forward to meet you, to meet different cultures, to bridge the culture and hear from your own uh, perspective what they think about uh, things that are going on in the world and how they look at the town. So this is uh, definitely a way forward, Svetlana. That's well seen. Then guide salary should be, and yes, we're in this for money as well. We want to make our money from it. And we know how it feels if the last day you work was the 24th of December last year. Um, so guide salary should be a day fee plus recommended tips. That means that you have a basic fixed salary and then a per person per day fee to make sure you can calculate how much money more or less you make. And then you can also calculate the number of days you need or want to work in a year to make your financial budget fit. So that is a good uh, indication. And then do you think virtual or online tours can help guides to raise money during the pandemic? Uh, Peter, maybe you are not uh, agreeing with this one. Uh, most of the people say no, people won't pay. It can be used only as promotion to attract clients for the future. So maybe Peter, you want to say something on uh, this last um, 
this very last uh, answer to share, and then we can close down the conference with thanks to everybody. So there's, the data for virtual tours is starting to come out now. So operators have been investing in virtual tours since last March, uh, or some operators, a significant percentage of operators, and data is starting to come out now. And we've had all tour operators do it direct from their own business, and we've had tour operators do it via platforms like Airbnb. The data that we've seen so far is a proportion are making money, but it's not a big proportion. It's a small proportion are doing it well. They have a big enough reach and they're making, and it's the right product with the right match. So there is money to be made in virtual tours based on the data from a small proportion of operators. Many operators who have gone into virtual are, are doing it for a future purpose. They're using it as a lead to keep their customers engaged, find new leads, to be able to deliver real in-person product further down the line. So when you look at virtual tours, you've got to ask what they're for. Are they being designed to make revenue now? Or are they being designed to generate revenue in the future because you're staying engaged with your, with your customers? My own opinion on them, and this is not data back, it's my opinion, is some people will do very, very well at virtual tours, but it will be a small proportion because the skill base you need to have, the technology you need to have, and the digital knowledge you need to have, and the entertainment value you need to deliver needs to be spectacular if you're going to charge $20, $30 for the virtual tour, because you're competing with Netflix and Prime with billions of dollars of investment, and they charge you $9 a month. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be doing this to generate money, you're going to have to be exceptional. But if you're going to do it to engage your customers and create a tighter bond with your customer journey, going back to the five stages of the customer journey, I think virtual tours are fantastic. But you have to know what you're using them for. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to applaud everybody. Thank you very much for being with us today. And we can hope we, get, we, we, hope we can serve you soon again with another topic that is... Uh, looking into 2021 and working and traveling again. Thank you very much. And please leave your review uh, if you wish on our website, St. Petersburg Tourism Forum, or on any other Facebook, social media, wherever you want. Thank you very much for joining and we look forward to seeing you somewhere else again. <laughs>